welcome again. Um, it's my pleasure to invite you uh, to listen in today. The Lord is in this place. And the Holy Spirit is not held back by any confines. The fact that you have logged on today and you're listening means that there's a word in store for you. I'm excited about today and what God is doing all around us. And so I just want to welcome you now to just loosen up and allow the Holy Spirit uh, to start to minister to you in the way he would. I want us to begin today by uh, doing something that we were commanded to do years ago. We don't do it just as a tradition, but we do it because of the covenant that we have with Jesus, the covenant that we have with Christ. Uh, because on that night, he took, he took the bread and he broke it amongst his friends. And he said, this is my body which will be bruised or which has been bruised for you and I. Take this in remembrance of me. As we take the communion today, I want you just to have a, re a revelation of who Christ is in your life. The fact that you are still seated there when so many have lost their lives today means that there is something in store for you and Christ is the head of your house. And so let's take this together with that new revelation saying, God, we give ourselves fully to you and nothing of ourselves but everything because of you. So let's do it together in Jesus' name. Likewise, he took the cup and said, this is my blood which was shed in Calvary for you and I. The shedding of this blood takes away all sin. Not some sin, all sin. I don't know what it is today that you feel that has held you back. This blood is more powerful than any other blood that has been shed. Any other blood. This is Christ's blood. And he says this takes away all the sin of man. And so as we take it, let's take it with that revelation today, knowing that our covenant was with him was permanent. It was sealed. It was finished. And upon the cross, he said, it is finished. Let's take it together. And so now, Lord, we thank you and we bless you. Lord, we do not take anything for granted. You are a good God. Indeed, you are our Savior. And Father, apart from you, we are nothing. Thank you, Father, for your saving grace. Thank you, Lord, that you sought us out even long before we knew that we had gone astray. And Father, thank you, because in that name, that powerful name of Jesus, you set free the earth and you set free the world. And so today, Father, we claim our freedom because he who has the Son is free indeed. And so we thank you and we bless you. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this time now. Take control, none of us, all of you. We welcome you into this place because, Father, we know <laughs> that the Holy Spirit does not go where he's needed. He goes where he's invited. And so we invite you now. Come and take charge. In Jesus' name. Amen. Damu ya ye esu Damu ya ye esu Damu ya ye esu Usafisha ka why don't you sing it with me? Damu ya Yesu Damu ya Yesu Damu ya Yesu Usa We've crossed over into the new month of May. 
and May is the fifth month. And five represents favor, and especially upon the human race. Five. It means that there's more grace in the month of May. Grace upon grace. I pray that you may find grace this month. That things you are ordinarily unable to do, you will find supernatural speed and supernatural enablement, the ability that comes from God to help you do things you know you would never have been able to do before. I pray that the Holy Spirit will be so real in your life in the month of May that in all you're doing, every time you turn around, you will just feel the presence of Almighty God. I pray that the things that you're seeking God for, this is the month that you will start to hear a response on those things. Remember, he's not a God who comes and shows you a glimpse and doesn't want you to have what he shows you. May will be that month that will be pivotal in your life. Start to ask God, Father, thank you. And in fact, start to bless the Lord and say thank you for the favor that you've already bestowed upon me and my family. Dad, mom, kids, know one thing. That this God that we serve corporately that you've heard of is actually an individual God. He will work in your favor if you seek him, if you trust him, if you believe him, if you obey him, you will find that there is no other God than the God that we are serving today. And so even as we have sung Damu Ya Yesu, I want you to know in every area that you are struggling right now, his blood, his blood conquers all. He conquered it on the cross. He conquered it in the grave. He's going to conquer it in your life in the mighty name of Jesus. I welcome you today because I have a word in season for you in Jesus' name. Grab your Bible, grab a pen. There will be one word, I believe, and I'm trusting God for this, that there will be one word that will transform someone's life and your life will never be the same again because Jesus is still in the business of changing lives. God bless you and welcome. Amen. The scripture today uh, and the text that we're going to be reading, we'll be reading from Acts chapter 3 from verse 1 to 16. So just get ready and ease our custom. Uh, before we read, I want us to say the statement of belief together. Uh, this statement of belief, again, is not just a tradition. We don't do it because uh, we must do it. No, we believe every word that is penned down. So I want you to read it with revelation. Be loud and audible. Because these are decrees and declarations that we're making upon our lives. Let's say. I am a winner and not a loser. I'm a victor and not a victim. I have changed my mind and my attitude to reflect what God says about me. My faith is built on God's word. I can do all that God says I can do. Nothing is impossible from this moment on. For I am a new breed, a new kind, a remnant, and I am after my purpose. Amen. So Acts chapter 3 verses 1 to 16 says and reads, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. Where you, he was put every day to beg for those going into the temple court. So this guy, you know, is, is brought to the gates, is brought to the temple gates so that as people are going in to worship, he's able to beg uh, the worshipers. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. He asked them for alms. Peter looked straight at him and, and so did John. Then Peter said, look at us, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. <laughs> but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. 
Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the man, the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man, verse 11, while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? I want us to jump to verse 16. By faith, in the name of Jesus, and the faith that comes through him, that has completely healed him, as you all can see. By faith, in the name of Jesus, this man who you see and know was, and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name. And the faith that comes through him, that has completely healed him, as you can see. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you, Lord, that it is only through faith. And it's only through your name, that matchless name of Jesus, <laughs> that we can receive all healing and all things for life and for godliness. Father, we thank you and we bless you. May this word speak to somebody right now. May somebody receive healing just by hearing this word now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, what is in a name? What is in a name? That's the title of today's message. What is in a name? What is in a name? It is obvious that the introduction of everything in life usually begins with its description. Whether it's a hurricane, a pandemic, a sickness or disease, it more often than not has a name. Nothing, nothing is nameless. Nothing. Very often, the first piece of information that we have about a person is their name. It frequently, it's frequently the first bit of information or data that you learn about someone. And we form judgments immediately about people fairly quickly. Africa, in particular, certain quarters want to know both your names. They want to know both your names in order to classify you into a tribal bracket. And quickly those judgments accumulate and thus the first piece of information tends to be very, very important. It certainly skews you in either a positive or a negative direction. The next phase tends to be about establishing your current status, either educational, marital, and oftentimes your societal positioning to further place you into another particular segment or a place. Finally, if they are still interested or intrigued, they may want to know what your mission and or assignment is or what your career goals are. This gives them an indication of who you are today and who you will be in future. <laughs> I remember many times going into cocktail parties and some of these businesses, you know, when they call for these cocktail parties, the idea is to come in and mingle and get to know one another, get to meet new people. And many times I have seen this happen where you walk up to someone or someone walks up to you and the Obviously, first, the first thing is you introduce yourself. And the next question is, what do you do? That person wants to know, do I need to spend any more time with you? Or should I wrap up and find the next person? Interesting, isn't it? I remember even when I was in college and when I was dating my wife today, many times we would go into a room or into a party or into a place and people would come and ask, what university are you at? And, and, you know, I would tell them the university I'm at. 
and they'd ask my wife, what university? Are you in the same university? And she said, no, we're not in the same university. I go to this other university. And immediately people just form their own opinions based on what you tell them, based on where you're at, based on the information and the data that you give them. <laughs> this, my friends, this is the beginning of stereotypes. This is the beginning of prejudices. Trying to classify people in particular places so that you know who do I want to hang out with or who do, not, do I not want to be seen with. It's funny that we often want to or find ourselves associating with people who are like us. Doing the same things we do. Probably living where we live. It's quite interesting. The human being. The human being. When we look at life's the life of Christ. I see three segments. I see his introduction into the world. And we'll start from Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Where it was prophesied, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. It was prophesied, it was seen that there will be a child at one point born in Bethlehem. And it was declared that he will be called Wonderful Counselor, <laughs> the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Luke chapter 1 verses 31 and 32. Angel Gabriel is sent to Mary, who is a virgin, getting ready to get married. And he comes and he gives her this message and says, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you shall call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Introductions, introductions, introductions. Luke chapter 2 verses 7 says, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now let's think about that for a second. It was prophesied that this man who's going to be the wonderful counselor, he's going to be the king of the Jews. This man who was going to be king over Israel, and not just Israel, but the world. This is the Son of God, <laughs> conceived through the Holy Spirit. How does it align with him being wrapped up in swaddling clothes and being laid in the manger? <laughs> the king of the world. You know, I remember sometime, I think it was in 2002, a great friend and mentor of mine called me up and says, Don, I want us to go somewhere. And so we flew from Texas City to Washington, D.C. And we found ourselves at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, the White House. And at some point, I was asking myself, how, do, how in the world am I at the White House? But that's not the point. I remember at some point, we were standing in the South uh, south, uh, the south lawn of the White House and this military or marine comes out and he blows this little trumpet and went something like this tu, 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 tu. and a voice said ladies and gentlemen the president of the United States my goodness the awe, the splendor, the power the glory of a mere man who's been given authority from God, by God, a president of a nation, the free world, the United States of America, he appeared in all his glory. And I said, my goodness, will it be like this in heaven when we see Jesus face to face? Then I'm reminded when Christ came on earth, the first place he was placed on was in a manger to depict humility, 
the king of kings in a manger. <laughs> the second thing was the establishment and the affirmation of Christ. Who is this Jesus? We've been introduced to him. We've seen how he's coming to the earth. But who is he? Who is behind this man? I can only imagine as a young Jesus hanging out with his father Joseph at their woodwork shop or at their shop at the back, at the shed at the back. Jesus probably with a hammer on one hand and his father with a jack plane on the other. And probably they were making the best furniture in the land. But to both of them, since the angel also appeared to Joseph. He knew that this was the child of promise. And for Christ, he knew why he was here on earth. Yet while hanging out at the back, they knew that there was a great promise, a greater promise for them. <laughs> Luke chapter 2 verses 42 to 50 says, And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy, Jesus, lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother, he didn't, who did not know it, but supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey. So they left and went a day's journey before they realized that Christ was not amongst them. And sought him out among, they sought him out among their relatives and their acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned back to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and the answers. <laughs> And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Remember, at 12 years old, father and mother for three days did not know where their son was. <laughs> and he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. <laughs> you know, I believe that God always has a way of showing us a small glimpse of who we are supposed to be in future. I always believe that. I believe with all my heart that the Lord does absolutely nothing here on earth before he reveals it to his own, the prophets. Nothing, absolutely nothing. You know, many times we've counseled young people who are getting ready to go into marriage. Many times we've, we've gotten so many different questions about different things and this. But there's one thing that the Lord always made clear to us that we always share with those who are about to get married. And we tell them this, there is no way, absolutely no way, the Lord will allow you to walk down the aisle. Remember, marriage is an institution that was constituted by God himself. He will never allow us to walk down an aisle with somebody without you knowing who that person is in the true sense. Let me give you a case in point. If you're dating someone today who's mean, mean-spirited, you will never walk down the aisle and say you had no idea that this guy was me. Absolutely not. There will be glimpses all around you. Maybe you walk into a restaurant and the way they treat the waiter or the waitress is a clear indication of the way they will treat you, if not worse, in future. <laughs> We've canceled so, so many people who've come up to us and say, we, I, I did not know, I did not know. But when we talk, it reveals itself. If that guy you're dating today is saying you're ugly, 
tells you you need to lose weight or you need to do one, two, three, I tell you this, as soon as you walk down that aisle, multiply that by a thousand times. You will hear it at every turn. If the guy is a kind guy, he will continue being kind. The Lord never allows you to walk into something that he's not showing you a glimpse. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 3 says, If the clouds are full of water, <laughs> they pour rain on the earth, whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there it will lie. Don't be shown glimpses and think that this person is going to turn around. Don't be shown anything and then cover it up and say, you know what? He's going to get saved. He's going to do this. No! You're walking into a time bomb that you can never come back and blame the Lord. That he never showed you a glimpse. Matthew chapter 3 verse 17 says this, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God in heaven established his own son here on earth <laughs> and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Thirdly, was his commissioning. After being established, after being introduced, established was his commissioning and the mission of Christ. Matthew chapter 1 verses 20 to 21 says, this is when the angel appeared to Joseph. Remember the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary. Now he's come and appeared to Joseph and he said, but after he has considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. Watch this. Why? Because he will save his people from their sin. He will save his people from their sins. Isn't it amazing that the job description of Jesus or his mission, if you would, was spoken of even before he was born. <laughs> it was clear long before his birth that he's coming to save the sinner. Jesus then confirms this mission in John chapter 8, verses 42. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me for I have come here from God. I have not come of my own. God sent me. He came and he was sent on a mission. And he confirmed it. Matthew chapter 15 verses 21 to 24. This depicts a story of the faith of a Canaanite woman. Leaving that place, verses 21, Jesus withdrew to a region of Tyre, and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. <laughs> and many would ask, why wouldn't he say anything? So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away. For she keeps crying out after us. And Jesus' response declares his mission here on earth. And he said this, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. His commission and mission was so clear. His assignment here on earth was so candid to him. John chapter 6 verses 38 to 40 says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, 
that none shall be lost, that all of us shall find salvation, that there'll be no one of us who will go astray. That was his mission. That was his purpose here on earth. <laughs> but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks on to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. And I wanted to draw some conclusions here. That was the life of Christ. How he was introduced. How he was confirmed and established by his father. And finally understanding his mission and why he came here on earth. I want to give you a challenge today. Let's look into your life. How have you been introduced? How was man introduced? <laughs> Romans 3. 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is our introduction. Man came into earth as a sinner. We were introduced into sin even long before we were born. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, For we all like sheep have gone astray. All of us. <laughs> Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 15 says you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you as man we are introduced into this space into the earth into the world as sinners but then how does God establish us this is what he does he comes and fixes the problem he says look in as much as you have come in as a sinner, this is what Christ came and did on the cross for you. First John chapter 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sin, <laughs> he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. Romans 10 verse 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Call upon the name of the Lord today and you will be saved. And that's what the scripture says. So an amendment. Christ comes and he becomes the buffer zone between us and God the Father. We were born as sinners. Thank you to Adam and Eve who fell in the Garden of Eden. But then Christ, God had a plan. He sent his own son, as John 3.16 says, to die on the cross for you and I so that we bridge the gap between man and God. <laughs> First John chapter 5, verse 20 says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. In his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. John 15, 7 says, If you remain in me, and my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Christ established us. Repaired the broken parts. The bridge was fixed. So that now, the only thing we're left to ask is then what is our great commission? What is our commission? What should we be doing here on earth? What is our mission here on earth? Jeremiah 1.5 says this. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Think about that for a minute. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, God says he knew you. Thank you, Jesus. Father, thank you for the assignment that you have for each and every one of us. Even for my hearers right now. Father, your word says you knew us before we were formed in our mother's wombs. May we not miss out on the mission and the vision and the things that we have been put here on earth to do. May our assignment be fulfilled before the coming, the day of the coming of the Lord. 
Before you were born, I set you apart, says the Lord. Before you were born, I set you apart. You are not every other person you've been set apart. That says the Lord. Mm, thank you, Jesus. You are a good God. <laughs> I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Speak good tidings into the nations. Do you know who the nations are? The nations are every single person around you. That is a nation. Speak good tidings upon them. Declare the goodness of the Lord here in this land of the living. The things that you want to see, start to speak them. Point them out. As we learned last time, the power of our words. Start to speak the things that we want to see come to pass. Say, Kenya is blessed. Say, the United States is blessed. If you're in Canada, say, Canada is blessed. All the nations of the world are blessed because you have been set apart as a prophet to the nations. Thank you, Jesus. Look, chapter 4, verse 18 to 19 says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor this is the year of the Lord's favor Matthew chapter 28 verse 16 to 19 here comes our great commission it says then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go when they saw him when they saw Christ they worshipped him but some doubted. Some doubted. Even today we have so many doubters. I pray that you're not a doubter today. But even if you are, Christ is about to show you who he is in your life. <laughs> then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You know, Christ wasted no time forming you. Don't you believe that God did not waste his time creating you? Don't you ever ask yourself, sit back and just reflect and say, why am I, why am I here on this earth? Why was I put here? What was the thing that I was sent here to do? Because remember, if he knew you before you were conceived in your mother's womb, then he knew the purpose that he had for you to send you here on earth. He knew Christ's purpose as we have seen and as we have read. Yet he sent him through the Virgin Mary, confirmed it through Joseph, by the angel Gabriel and he came here and established him here on earth and he gave him his purpose my prayer for you is that in the next couple of days you will seek the Lord for your true purpose why are you here on earth I know you're not here to waste any space because I know my God does nothing for nothing there is a reason by which you were planted. And I pray that you may find it, that you may seek him and find out, God, why did you put me here on earth? <laughs> In conclusion, it's important to note that Christ picked us before we chose him. He chose us before we chose him. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 to 5 says, For he chose he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight in love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will John 1 12 says yet to all who did receive him to those who believed in his name he gave them the right he gave them the right to become children of God child of God you are seated in a high place in heavenly places together with Christ let nothing here on earth phase you 
because you came in with an assignment you came in for something you came in to be able to accomplish something don't be phased by coronavirus don't be phased by unemployment don't be phased by having no food right now remember this is just a temporary inconvenience it is a setback for a comeback for someone i sense that i sense that it is a setback for a comeback you know when the scripture says that when people are crying out and saying that there's a casting down, ooh, I sense that somebody is going to be crying out saying there's a lifting up in my life. Could it be you? Could it be you, my sister? Could it be you, my brother? There's a lifting up. Start to declare it. Walk around like a madman in your room and say there's a lifting up. Shout at the top of your voice that there is a lifting up in my life now in the mighty name of Jesus. Because Colossians chapter 3 verse 17 says, and ask whatever you do in word or deed, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Not in your name, but in the name of our Lord Jesus. Giving thanks to God, the Father through him but John 14 13 verse 14 says this ask whatever you ask in my name <laughs> man listen to that promise ask whatever you will ask in my name says the Lord mm -hmm. that which you ask I will do says the Lord that the father may be glorified in the son if you ask anything in my name says the Lord I will do it if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. You know, one thing about scripture and one thing about Christ I know is this. He never repeats something if it wasn't meant to be there. There's absolutely no wasted word that Christ uses. In this scripture, he says, and whatever you ask, not some things, but whatever, ask for the moon, whatever you ask, in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask, verse 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I will do it. John chapter 16, verse 23 says, And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give to you. Proverbs 18 Verse 10 says, the name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and they are safe. What do you need? What are you running away from today? The Father says, run to me. You will be safe under the shadow of my wing. Mark chapter 1, verses 40 to 42 says, Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing... You can make me clean. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> May he move in compassion in your situation right now. But Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing. Be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him. And he was cleansed and he was made whole. I don't know what it is, child of God. I don't know what it is, man, woman, child, that you're seeking for help today. And you don't even know where to turn. The scripture says, try me or test me. Today I want to give you a challenge. If you do not know this Jesus, try him. Try him. And I'll ask you to pray this simple prayer after me and say, Lord Jesus, I have heard your word today. I want to try you for myself. Lord, I do not want to hear any more about you. I want to experience you for myself. So now, Lord Jesus, I welcome you into my heart. Take full control of my life. 
and be Lord and Savior from today on. Father, write my name in that Lamb's book of life. And Father, thank you. Like the thief on the cross, welcome me or have me as you come into your kingdom. Lord, I thank you and I bless you. And I declare today that from today, my life will never, ever be the same again. If you pray that simple prayer with us, I want you to know that now you are a believer, you are a saint. The word says that there is victory in heaven right now and celebration because one person has come to know Christ. You are being celebrated right now in heaven. For those of you who are believers, I want you just to seek God during this time and say, Father, what is it that you need me to do? What do you want me to concentrate on? What is it, Lord, that I need to understand about my mission here on earth? What should I be doing? Yes, I understand the Great Commission, but how can I further the kingdom of God during this time? The Lord who is willing, the Lord who is able, will start to speak to you, but I, I implore you, I urge you, start to listen to his still small voice because he's speaking to you today as audibly as he spoke in the yesterday years. Let us all close our eyes and pray together. Lord, we pray for every situation, every condition, every ailment that surrounds your children right now in the mighty name of Jesus. That name that we have spoken of, that name that is mightier than any other name, above any other name, Thank you that your word says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that you are God. We speak open heaven upon those under the hearing of my voice right now. These, Lord, are unprecedented times. And we have more questions than we do have answers, yes. But how blessed we are that you have said in Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3 that we should call upon you and you will answer us and tell us great and unsearchable things we do not know nothing of. <laughs> but only if we do away with the yoke of oppression and with a pointing finger and a malicious talk. Lord, we repent as a nation from the highest office to the lowest pair of peasants. May you find a remnant that causes you to turn the fortunes around for your people. Your word says in Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then Lord, you will hear from heaven and will forgive our sin and you will heal our land Lord, thank you for healing Kenya right now. Lord, thank you for healing our family right now. Lord, thank you for healing an individual right now. These things, Lord, we have prayed. Believing and trusting in the holy, matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You are a good God. You are a good God. Father, we thank you and we bless you. Thank you, Lord. What is in a name? <laughs> no other name but the name of Jesus. No other name but the name of the Lord. No other name but the name of Jesus is worthy of glory and worthy of honor and worthy of power and our praise. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name.
May God bless you and keep you. Until next time, he's Lord over your life. Trust him this week. Believe in him and see your life and things in your life start to align. God bless you.